has been a, an editor in many important sound journals. He's written uh, software packages that have been widely used. And it's really not an exaggeration also to say that he uh, has written uh, a few high-sided papers that are actually uh, you know, taught in uh, some graduate courses. So it's really fantastic to have Uri. And anybody who has any uh, um, fondness to uh, good German literature or to good mafia stories will be intrigued by this title. So uh, take it away, Uri. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, uh, uh, Do you hear me? Can everyone hear okay? Uh, it okay. looks fine to me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. I guess I should uh, talk without moving my head too much because of the microphone. Um, the, should I tell you where the title comes from? No, I'm not going to tell you that. So, um, at the beginning, in the beginning, there was L2. <laughs> And uh, if you take a look at the, the closest web page on financial matters, you will find a mysterious beta there with values, and that beta is the coefficient of uh, regression curve, and that regression curve is done using L2 data fitting. Okay? And of course, there are many, many other applications in which uh, L2 norm and L2 based techniques are being used today. But uh, in recent years, there has been a big surge of, uh, of methods that are based on L1 rather than L2, uh, the norm L1. It will be introduced in a moment. And, uh, and I wanted to, first of all, talk a little bit about uh, how that, you know, uh, why, why, why that uh, excitement about L1-based techniques. And then we move from, uh, from there. So first of all, um, First of all, let me turn it on. Yeah. First of all, um, I have uh, two co-authors in this effort, uh, Case van den Dahl, who has been a research associate in our department for quite a while, and uh, Eldad Haber sitting here. I don't see Case, but Eldad is sitting here, uh, who is a faculty member in uh, uh, Earth, Ocean, and Sciences department, as well as mathematics. So. Uh, here's an outline. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time uh, on introduction, really, motivation and introduction. And hopefully, by the time I'm done with that, the rest of the out outline will become clearer. Uh, so let me just move on, and I'll bring this outline again when uh, we switch gears. So let me first talk about motivation uh, for the whole thing. And that motivation has to do with why L1 has been so uh, popular, and that has to do with the sparse solutions, sparse, sparse solution representations in various situations. So uh, I'm going to show you some, some example and some very quick discussion on uh, sparse solutions, and uh, then another e example, or a bunch of examples really, on uh, piecewise smooth surface reconstruction, and then uh, this L1-based versus L2-based. Uh, this is the second or third time I give this talk, and each time I wonder how this picture will show up in... <laughs> and this, of course, depends a lot on the sort of uh, 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 devices that are used to project it to you. Uh, but uh, it, depicts, uh, it depicts boats in Vietnam, and uh, it was taken by an SLR cam camera, and uh, what you see here is uh, a uh, compression of the original by a factor of about 16. Okay? And uh, so uh, you have an image, usually in raw image, if you use a good SLR, you have a huge number of pixels uh, if you convert it to uh, uh, using a DCT uh, transform or a wavelet transform, you have a huge number of uh, uh, basis functions. In this case, it's about uh, 12 million. And, uh, and so with this abundant amount of information, the big question is how to handle it. And there are techniques to try to uh, represent it in using uh, sparse means uh, in order to be able to compress it. And as I said, this is a compression uh, that looks even more uh, amazing on my computer rather than on this large screen. I guess it relatively high quality compression, despite the large factor. So 
the question is, how do you choose those uh, coefficients uh, that of, of wavelet basis functions or of uh, uh, Fourier basis functions uh, that you would like to preserve? And uh, for this, we look at this mathematical formulation uh, written up there, where we have the uh, we have data B, uh, given image, and there is a J times U matrix J times U, uh, which is what the uh, uh, image that we are trying going to reconstruct going to how it's going to uh, relate to the data. And so this is a data misfit uh, sort of uh, term here. And you want to minimize, let's say, let's say that these are just the coefficients of uh, some wavelet or, or, or uh, a, a discrete cosine transform uh, basis functions in uh, the P norm. Okay. Subject to uh, this epsilon has to do with noise in general. And in fact, if you uh, use some uh, Lagrange multipliers, uh, this formulation can be related to this formulation, uh, where you have the, data, the same data fitting term here in the two norm, it doesn't matter. Uh, what matters is what the P is here, and that relates to some uh, regularization uh, uh, functional R of U, the same guy here, where with the coefficient beta here and epsilon here. This, this is called a, a Tikhonov. Uh, regularization functional or, or a technical uh, regularization uh, problem. Okay, so the question is what is P? In idea, ideally, we want the best, the smallest number of uh, non zero coefficients uh, to represent the same solution. Okay, and, uh, and uh, so we want P equals zero. P equals zero is a funny, it's not the norm at all actually, uh, but uh, we know what we mean. We, mean. we mean the smallest number of non zero coefficients. Okay. Uh, but that is NP-hard, the, the problem of finding uh, the smallest number of coefficients is NP-hard. Uh, and so what about P equal to the usual L2 norm? <laughs> Turns out that the usual L2 norm, uh, this, the, what's under the norm here is typically not going to be sparse. That's the problem with L2. And uh, on the other hand, if you use L1 norm instead, then typically this WU, equals Z here, uh, is going to be sparse. Only a few of these very long vector of unknowns, which are the coefficients of, let's say, wavelength basis functions, uh, is going to be non-zero. That's uh, really a major reason why uh, people have looked so much uh, at L1 norm in recent times. And a very important one of that. Here's another set of applications. Maybe. So we just switched from one set of application to another. And now we're looking at this. Uh, is there anyone in the audience that who has never seen this picture before? It's one of those things that always crop up. <laughs> um, and so uh, I'm not going to dwell on it. You know, this is the last time you're going to see it in this talk. Uh, so you have an ex a, a, a ground truth, and you have a noisy image of the same thing, and you want to remove the noise and obtain, obtaining, this is your data, and you want to remove the noise, obtaining something close to the true solution. Uh, more interesting a bit is if you have a deblurring kernel there. So uh, this is your data. It's a blurring of the original, not just a, a noise added, but a, a blurred, uh, blurred data. Uh, and you want uh, maybe to use some sort of a Tikhonov type regularization, which is the same formulation as before. Uh, again, we have here data fitting term. B is the, is the data, the corrupted data. Uh, U uh, is hopefully going to be somehow the, the, the cleaned data. And J would be the something like identity or like, uh, or like the blaring kernel in case of a deblaring problem. And then there's a functional R of U. And here, R of U would be uh, a discretization of this integral of the magnitude of the gradient of U to a power P. So the, the same P as before. The question is, what should we choose? P equal 1 or P equal 2? Okay. So uh, P equal 2, that will be the 2 norm of the gradient. And uh, the problem here is that we have edges. Edges in this. Uh, in this here uh, intensity function coming at you. Uh, edges mean discontinuities. Discontinuities, if you're going to look at a gradient across a discontinuity, you are going to look at a delta function. And the problem with the L2 norm is that this delta function squared, and then you integrate them, 
and uh, square, the squares of a delta function is not integrable. So what that would gonna do is uh, the, the numerical algorithm would somehow avoid that problem by smearing the, the edge. And that's what we see, we see smearing of an edge. Uh, on the other hand, if we, do, if we put p equal one here, then we get a delta function which is integrable, you see? So with the one norm, you actually can get uh, uh, sharper edges than the two. Again, something that has been well known. The point is that there is a reason why it happens, not only that it has been observed. Okay, so the, the case of L1 here is called total variation, the, the L1 norm on the gradient. Yeah. Uh, and the solution uh, uh, then produces sharper, uh, sharper edges. In addition, it is also blocky. Now, what does it mean, blocky? It's kind of piecewise, piecewise constant. That means that the gradient is, piece, is almost, is very sparse, right? Because where you have uh, a, block, a blocky image, uh, you get a sparse derivative, sparse gradient. So in fact, L1 has something to do with sparseness or sparsity, but it is not simply in the, uh, in the sense of picking up the right set of coefficients for, for a representation of one solution. If you allow it to play with the solution itself, with the surface that you're trying to reconstruct, it also will, do, will try to do something sparse. It's important to understand that there is similarity in that L1 goes after sparsity, and also a dissimilarity in the sense that if the surface that you're trying to reconstruct is not piecewise constant, uh, L1 is going to do it anyway. In other words, you may not actually obtain a good results in some situations, because uh, in this total variation, you got, you're gonna get a blocky image quite different really, but at the same time, a similar property of the L1 norm. Uh, how do you uh, uh, implement that? The, if you look at, uh, at uh, the uh, um, continuous formulation of this thing with the integral, you have to take gradient of the integral, and you come up with a discretization really of, of uh, a term like this. I'm not sure how many people uh, you know, feel uh, affinity to this kind of thing. But uh, generally, if you look at uh, this mess as just being one, then you have minus div grad, which is Laplacian. So it's just a Laplacian. That corresponds to diffusion, simply diffusion. A diffusion operator smooths everything in uh, equal measures in all directions. Okay? So uh, this is just diffusion. That will be the L2 case. The L1 case corresponds to anisotropic diffusion where basically you, uh, you diffuse in directions where it's smooth and you do not diffuse across edges. That's the idea of what L1 does. Okay? That's anisotropic diffusion. And so uh, uh, you have a term here that looks like one over the, grade no the magnitude of the gradient of U. So where there's a jump, this guy will be large, this will be small, and there will be no diffusion in that direction. And whereas uh, if uh, grad u is, uh, is not, uh, not close to zero, then there will be a diffusion in that direction. And uh, uh, we actually did some work uh, using Huber function, which basically uses this uh, L1 total variation as uh, so long as there is a jump there. And the jump is determined by some constant gamma. Otherwise, we use L2. Okay. And the question is which gamma to choose, uh, and uh, this was our choice. This is actually our contribution. The rest of it has been known for many, many years. Uh, never mind what our contribution is. The point is that you have to actually uh, also uh, modify the, the uh, choice of, of the total variation operator as well. If you do that, then, however, you get nice results uh, sometimes. So here is an example from a paper with, with Hue Huang. Uh, so this is the image uh, of a medieval village uh, with, with lots of edges, and uh, and uh, here's a blur. Here's a blur. The blur data, and uh, we know the blurring kernel, and we want to reconstruct the original image or something close to it. There's also noise here. You, you do not reconstruct exactly this, but something reasonable. And here is the result obtained using this total variation. So you actually do get these edges reconstructed. That cannot be done with L2. You, again, like, like in the previous example, you really cannot do it with L2. You really do need L1. You need total variation or something else, but definitely not L2. Okay, two examples. Um, 
sometimes even L1 is not sharp enough. I mean, the, 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 the point is that L2 is not as sharp as L1, okay? But uh, sometimes uh, even L1 is not uh, sharp enough, really denoising. Uh, you know, since this is a home crowd, I can tell you that, uh, that total variation is not so great for denoising. In fact, there are better things for denoising. Um, and here's an example of a surface reconstruction of a very famous example once again. Uh, and so this bunny is now corrupted and there's noise. Here's your data and you want to denoise this with, uh, but you want, but, but if you do it using just diffusion or anything like that, you're going to get, uh, uh, the bunny will lose its, uh, its fur. So you want to try to re uh, uh, remove the noise, which is high frequency sort of uh, a phenomenon without losing the fur like here. Uh, that, uh, that, uh, so, so with lots of, uh, of texture. You want to retain the texture and remove the noise. And so for this we needed uh, something non-convex, a non-convex regularizer. L1 is uh, the last convex function uh, as you move from P to less, from two, less, 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 less until one. One is the last convex function from there on, it's not convex. <laughs> And this guy, that what we used here is also a not, not convex regularizer. This is another one, or denoising effect uh, from, from, from another such paper or with similar techniques. Okay, so you can do better. With, with L1, uh, with, with uh, anisotropic diffusion, uh, you just cannot get results. You need something even more than L1. However, we, this, is going, this is taking us in the direction which is different from what I want to look at. Let me just mention that people have looked at P less than one. Uh, one of those people is sitting right here, Osgore. Uh, and uh, the thing is that uh, for P less than one, you actually have a, uh, a uh, non-convex, as I said, uh, functional. So you may, you may introduce trouble if you're not careful with that. Um, in computer graphics, this is uh, hit the shell, or well, the shelf I was going to say, but it hit sort of uh, percolated to, uh, into the level of recognition uh, with a paper in SIGGRAPH in 2007 uh, where they chose P equals 0 0.8 for some deblurring uh, application. Uh, there has been a time that I was very interested to know what is special about P equals 0 0.8. Um, I found nothing. <laughs> um, and uh, after a while I decided that uh, I was going to ask, in fact, uh, Anat Levin where did she get this peer equals 0 0.8? Uh, and the answer was, oh, it could be 0 0.92 or 0 0.7. But it is less than one. Okay. I, I, was, I should say I, was, I spent a few weeks trying to prove that 0 0.8 has some magic properties. In my <laughs> Point is, uh, however, really, uh, that was, I think it is fair to say, a special situation. And in general, P equal 1 is fine. P equal 1 is fine for graphics applications. That I believe that is the consensus. Some people here know way more than me about computer graphics, and you're welcome to correct me on that. Uh, here are some books and papers that are of, of our kind of fundamental importance in this area. So for the L1, they're the including compressive sensing. Uh, they are texts by Malai and Elad, and uh, key papers by Donohoe and Candes and their co-authors. And uh, regarding total variation, uh, the first <coughs> paper that sort of started a new, the whole new thing was by Rudin Ocean and Fatemi. Uh, the ideas, some of them have been there before, but uh, that paper really opened up an area. And uh, here are two books. Um, this one in particular is famous among some people uh, that, that also contains uh, a lot about uh, total variation uh, methods. In fact, so much so, that uh, people suggest that, and you may wonder, maybe L2 is, you know, the time has passed you now, and we should just move to L1, and uh, basically, any new application that we have, it is L1 that we have to start working with. That was suggested, uh, in fact, that's what started us. Uh, Dad and I were in a conference together, <coughs> and one of the colleagues that we both esteem, uh, hold in high, high esteem gave a talk and suggested this. The problem is that this doesn't quite agree with our experience. That's the problem. That's actually what gave, up, gave uh, rise to the title of the talk. So maybe it's too far to say that uh, we should forget L2. It's just, just too, too soon, too soon. 
And, uh, and in fact, it doesn't quite agree with our experience in several situations. And so this uh, caused us to try to formulate uh, where it is that we see that, uh, that, that, that we have to be more careful. Okay. So I'm going to show you an example, a further example uh, now, but before that I, want, I need to introduce some notation because I keep on saying L1 and L2 and with the important is that there, that there are situations where I would have a gradient and uh, there are where I won't. So let's say uh, uh, use, I'm going to sort of try to imprint this in your mind. So big L2 would be uh, this, you know, this uh, um, objective function with uh, two norm here uh, uh, just for the coefficients, not derivatives. Big L1 would have the one norm, the same thing. L2G would have the gradient here, okay, of, of a surface. L1G would have the gradient of a surface, this one with the two norm and this one with the one norm. Uh, this notation is kind of uh, 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 not perfect in a way because when you use a very flat basis, you actually also have some basis functions that approximate derivatives. But let's not talk about that. In many situations, it's pretty clear what I'm talking about when I say big L1 or big L1G. So now, let me show you an example. Um, again, deblaring, because deblaring is one of, the, of those uh, problems where people really think that everyone does the job. And even then, we would like to suggest that sometimes you have to be a little more open-minded. So this is, an M, uh, this is the MATLAB example of an MRI image. Uh, and uh, this is the problem that, this is the image that we are trying to reconstruct. Uh, we blur it using this blurring kernel, kernel, add 1% white noise, and this is our data. And for this now we're going to use three, uh, three methods. One of them is this L1G that you saw worked very well before, but uh, here you will see in a moment it doesn't. Um, and the other two are codes that we did not write ourselves. Uh, there's this code by, by Jim Nagy. Actually, Jim Nagy gave a talk here last year and talked about this code. Okay. Um, appears in a book uh, that, uh, that uh, Hanson Nagy and O'Leary wrote. That's an L2 type code. And then GPS, GPSR is a code uh, uh, which employs a wavelet L1 recovery algorithm, very famous code. And then uh, this L1G code uh, that, that, that is standard, you know, from, from, from our own lab. Okay. That, that wrote, in fact. So first, let me remove this L1G from considerations. In this case, remember that L1G actually give you a blocky image, whether you want it or not. And here, it's just uh, the, the results are not good. It's too blocky. So with the medieval village, they did this, that did a great job, but here it doesn't. But, you, but usually when you look at the deep learning algorithms, you, you would look at L1 or L2 rather than uh, the gradient, uh, involving the gradient. So let's concentrate on this compared to that. Okay. So this one here is using Nagy's code, and this one here is using uh, the GPSR code. I don't know if you can see, but this is a, there's a halo here that comes because of the wavelet. But let's, let's ignore that. But even if you ignore that, uh, you cannot say that this is really better than this. I mean, they are essentially the same. So using L1 here hasn't given you anything. I mean, it hasn't given you an advantage. And the point is that L2, the L2 code, costs about a factor of 30 less, something like that. They're not even comparable in, in price, you see. And it's something, this is something that it's important to understand. The L1 calculations, they don't come cheap. They are much more complicated <coughs> to uh, program and expensive to carry out than corresponding L2 calculations. Okay? In other words, if we were to compare techniques between L1 and L2 based regularizations, the L1 regularization has to give better results in order to be worth it. If they give similar results, L2 wins. Okay? Like here, the factor, as I said, is about 30. So with this in mind, we tried to kind of uh, formulate to ourselves, really. Uh, where is it, you know, what is it that makes L1 work and what is it that makes it not work as well? 
So I'll talk first about poor data and then about highly ill-conditioned large problems. For poor data, I have to tell you what poor data means. It's actually a non-trivial non thing to say. Uh, and I will discuss outliers, relatively high noise level, and uh, rare, uh, rare data. Three different uh, instances of poor data. I, I will discuss this in a moment. So, in fact, L1 can be good for some sort of poor data when you have outliers. L1 is good for outliers. Well known, in fact. Uh, uh, there is even a paper in SIGGRAPH from 2007, and, but this has been known for uh, since at least the 60s. Uh, it was, in fact, a cornerstone on which I built my PhD thesis uh, that, was, uh, that, that, appeared, that uh, I finished in 1975. So uh, let's look, in order to understand that best, best, it's worthwhile to look at an overdetermined system. So our matrix J until now was kind of uh, short and fat, you know, fewer, fewer rows than columns. Now let's look at a matrix which has uh, more rows than columns. Uh, and, uh, and Y is data and uh, X, uh, we're looking for a short vector X that fits the, a lot of data, basically. And so each, each row in this, mate, is this, in this uh, uh, set of, the, of, uh, of uh, data fitting, fitting terms corresponds to one, it's one, one residual for one uh, row. And so, uh, if, so you can actually formulate that using uh, linear programming. It's a linear programming problem. And then you look at the dual. And when you're done playing with that, it turns out that the basic variables for those who know linear programming terminology, the basic variables of the dual corresponds to, row, to rows of residuals which are zero. Uh, and now if you look at the, in a, some y which is not in the basis, which is most of them, and you, you take it away from where it was and from all the other data, nothing changes because it was non-basic and remains non-basic. It does not determine the solution at all. <coughs> okay? And that's why outlier, it, the outliers are not, uh, you know, L1 is good for outliers. Um, so it's a particular thing that occurs for L1 and not for L2. L2 will try to actually go through, through some outlier, whereas L1 will some, simply ignore it because it's non-basic. It's from linear programming theory. However, that doesn't mean that L1 is good for all noisy data. It's good for outliers. Okay? If you just have a uh, high, high noise level, then L1 is, doesn't have any particular property. People sometimes mistake this because it's good for outliers. No, it's good for, for bad data. That's not true. It's good for outliers. <coughs> Moreover, in order for L1, remember L1 is a sharpener. It, uh, if you get good results with sharp corners, it, it sort of tries to find the sh it sort of retain sharpness. Then, uh, but if you don't have enough data, you're not going to see the, the advantage. You have to have enough good data. I will show you an example of that. Oh, and let me also mention that poor depends on the application. You cannot just say it's poor. What does it mean? So for example, if you have a deblurring problem with noise, then a little bit of noise already makes the data poor because denoising is smoothing, whereas deblurring is sharpening. And so if you have them both, you're in trouble. Whereas uh, if you're doing denoising rather than deblurring, then you can have 15% uh, noise and you can still remove it. And this, sometimes you, you can see that amazing things happen, you know, 50% of noise disappears. But that's because it's denoising. You cannot do that with the blurring. So, so what is poor data is not just sort of level of noise. It depends on the application. Like, likewise, what rare data is depends if you, are, if you have a bunch of points. If the points describe a straight line or a plane, then you don't need many points to describe that. Whereas if you have a corner, then of course, points near the corner. Uh, it depends on curvature. Okay, so poorness is not just a uh, L2 uh, L2 distance. It depends also on curvature. So here's a very simple example, really. So uh, we start with a signal U star of t, which has discontinuities. Therefore, L1 should uh, L1g total variation should be better than L2g. Um, and now we, we sample it 512 points and then randomly select 
in of those 512 points, add some noise, and say this is a data, reconstruct the signal. So uh, this is the case here with nine data pairs like this over here. Uh, the red is using L2 and the blue is using L1. G. Okay. And, and here you can see that even though uh, L1G should have been better because of these discontinuities, it's not better because there's not enough data for it to be better. If it's not better, it is worse. <laughs> Remember that. <laughs> So you just do total variation, you don't use any sparsifying basis? No, 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 just total variation directly on the, on the data here. Sparsifying basis, actually, I want to recover that, probably exactly. I doubt, but I can generate <laughs> Okay. No, no, but this is straightforward on the points, on the, on the, on the points. <coughs> we now increase the number of, uh, of uh, values from 9 to 28. Now suddenly L1G is better yeah. because yeah, there's more data and now it can, it can talk. So, so uh, the L2G oscillates here and here, whereas L1G just goes directly through. And if we increase beta, the higher beta, the more smooth it is, uh, then uh, the L2G curve is much smoother than it should be. The typical smoothing uh, operation uh, for the L2 norm that I was discussing before. So you need enough data in order to see anything. Okay. And then maybe you were looking at me and saying, why are you wasting your time with this obvious conclusion? <laughs> uh, but I'm going to, I was to show you a situation where maybe it's not so obvious, okay? And here it is. So, uh, so now we have a laser scanner uh, for a three-dimensional object that we want to represent on the computer and the three-dimensional object in, um, that we have in mind at the moment uh, has, is, is, yeah. has a, a, thin, uh, a thin shape, in, in a cross-section of a thin shape, and uh, there's an angle of this thin shape, okay? 150 degrees. It's kind of uh, delicate because uh, the difference between this and smooth is not so incredibly sharp. So, uh, if, so these are the points uh, obtained by the scanner, then we use a classical PCA algorithm by Hoppe and I forget who are the co-authors from 92, uh, which attaches normals to those. And of course, when you have noise in the data, the normals are even with more noise. Okay. Uh, and so uh, where is the edge? It's gone. I mean, the, where, where is the angle uh, of uh, 150 degrees? It's completely gone because of the noise. And so now the question is maybe we should use L1, uh, uh, an L1 regularization of this thing to get the, the normals to align. And here is uh, uh, a work, well, this, is, this basically follows work by uh, these four people, including Chen, uh, who is, uh, was kind, so kindly introduced to me only a few minutes ago. Um, and this is the result, much better than before. But not perfect. I mean, you don't see an, an, an angle here. Right? So maybe you say, okay, well, nothing will re re reconstruct the angle. It was so bad, it was so bad here. Uh, but, uh, but in fact, uh, our method does it. Let, let, let's not worry about what our method is. The point is, it's possible to do. So, uh, so again, uh, the point here is that the data away from the edge uh, is definitely sufficient for L1 to work, but the data at the edge is not sufficient. It's, it's more sparse in the relative to the curvature. Another class of problems, we are now getting worse in certain, or maybe more complicated or more complex. So when we are leaving uh, um, uh, uh, image, 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 image processing behind, and uh, let's look at uh, other things. So we have now a large ill-conditioned problem because we are trying to solve some partial differential equation in order to get to go to, to uh, fit data. L1 gives difficult computational difficulty. I'm going to talk about that, and then we'll discuss two problems: one, computed myography, and the other is. Uh, well, non, uh, what's written here, we'll get there, everything will become clear. So, 
So we are beginning with, by the way, when there's no, uh, when there's nothing here, it's the two norm. Okay, each time there's one norm, I will write one there. But when there's nothing there, it's the two norm. The data, the data fitting has always been with the two norm. The, the question whether it's one norm or two norm is, is over here in the regularization operator. And there are famous codes that use L1, including this GPS R that I mentioned, including SPGL1, which, is, uh, uh, which was written by Michael Friedlander, who's sitting here, and, uh, and uh, Ewald Vandenberg. And uh, there is another code called L1 Magic, I think, uh, from Caltech. L1 Magic, yeah. Uh, from, from, by Candace, and I forget the name of the guy who actually wrote it, who was a student. These codes uh, are very good if you have well-conditioned problem. The, 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 what they do is they have some very sophisticated ways that, uh, in, that, that handle non-smooth constraints, non-smooth problems. But if you have uh, uh, a highly imposed problem, these codes will have problems because they are basically gradient-based. They are just gradient projection-based. And all of them uh, would have problems uh, if, you, uh, if you have a highly imposed one. I shouldn't say that. All of them have difficulties of converging when you have a high, highly ill-posed problem. So that's the problem with L1. With L1G, compared to L2G, situation is still better because L1G improves uh, discontinuities and we still have that. <coughs> okay. uh, so L1G will, will remain uh, in, in, in contention. So let me just move to the first of these two uh, relatively large applications that I mentioned before. These are two papers with Dinesh Pai um, that, that Case and I wrote. Uh, basically, uh, don't look at it, at it, at it look at me. <laughs> so it's easier to understand quickly. So uh, uh, I have a limb, okay, and, a, and I want to figure out which of the muscles inside the f have fired and which not. And, uh, and uh, I want to do that without penetrating, without measuring, uh, measuring anything inside. Rather, only measure uh, voltage differences uh, on, on the surface of the body, which is my limb. Okay. So here is a, a cross section of my limb. Well, it's not mine, but of somebody's limb. <laughs> uh, that somebody else, in fact, uh, uh, processed and uh, using MRI scan and, and, uh, and uh, what's the word, segmented to three, uh, to three groups, muscle groups. And, uh, and uh, they are brachialis, biceps, and triceps. That's the same guy as this one, but uh, looking more like uh, something that you want, you know, maybe to plan dinner around. So, um, here's an, so, so what do we do? We, we generate the data ourselves. What do we do? We, we basically make uh, uh, one of those muscle groups fire, the others not, generate data, add noise, and try to reconstruct the, 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 the solution. And here's a case where the solution is reconstructed because the muscle group that fires is highlighted here. Dif the, the different colors that mean different values. Uh, whereas the other ones didn't fire. Likewise here for the other group, I forget which one of them is by which name, goes by which name. But this is more difficult because it's more inside, more away the, uh, from the boundary. So it's possible to solve it, but it's a very difficult problem as it turns out. Uh, mathematically what it is, is uh, you have the, the following divergence of sigma grad v, gra sigma is con uh, conductivity and the MRI scan gave you that, so sigma is known here, equal to an unknown source, and you want to find the source given potential field. So you measure potential field around the arm, uh, and you want to find the source U that gave this, uh, gave rise to this potential, or potential differences rather, um, uh, from, from, uh, by, so by inverting the process here, u in terms of v, get u in terms of v. So this actually is like our previous problem. It doesn't look like it, but it is. So because if you, uh, you look at that and you say, oh, I discretize it and therefore this is going to be a matrix times a vector that represents my, my potential. Uh, my potential field, and so V is A inverse U, OK? 
okay? And then I measure it around the boundary, that is gonna be Q, so my matrix J is Q times A inverse. A is a square matrix, but Q is a matrix with many more columns than rows, and so we are back to the notation we had before, so. Ah, right here, okay? This J is this matrix Q that tells you where you're measuring the data times A inverse, where A inverse is a solution of the PD. <coughs> and that is highly ill-posed. And in fact, uh, you can have very different sources of explaining given data, the same given data. There's no one-to-one -one correspondence here. So uh, your choice of regularization is not just what gives you sparsity. Your choice has to do with what gives you the right thing that you're looking after. Yes, the, the regularization, in fact, is an a priori information, very different from different representation for a wavelet basis, completely different. Um, but now the model is uh, uh, like strands, for those of you who are from the Nash's uh, group, <laughs> strands. Uh, and so maybe you, uh, you, you can use uh, some sort of an L1 approximation to pick up where those strands are, where, where those muscles are. But here is where uh, Case, in fact, tried uh, all these three codes that I mentioned and none of them converged at all. So the question is, what should we do? Rush to fix the codes? Or maybe we should first figure out whether there's a problem here to solve. Does it make to solve, the sense to solve the problem? <coughs> so then we took, we, we took a look not at 3D, but at 2D. Uh, for 2D, we can actually invert matrices exactly instead of using iterative methods. And, uh, and now we set sigma equal one, and so it's just a, a Poisson equation. So V is a, for, for any U that I'm guessing, I'm getting potential field V, which is a solution of a Poisson equation on a square. Much more, hand, uh, you can handle that, and you can make many experiments. And so, uh, again, the idea is, let's figure out what uh, can we do with this problem before we spend energy in trying to solve it using uh, L1 in the three-dimensional case. So here's a, a, an example just to show you how bad it, things can be. So the ground truth here is a, as a step function. Okay? We, we are concentrating on the little square here. And L2G smears it, as L2G always does. L1G is better, so L1G wins, except that now I start with an, oops, now I start, yeah. Now I start with the solution that is, or uh, the, the exact solution is smeared and you get, I get the same results. So whereas before L1G was closer to the solution, now it is L2G that is closer to the solution because the, the results that I get are not so sensitive to what the exact problem was. Uh, more to the point is, if I have a pair, a source like this, a, a, a source that, uh, that has a, a pair of values, one below the background and one above the background, okay? uh, L2G gives me this, not much. L1G is a nicer result. Basically, at least it says that there is something less than, than average here and more than average here. That's maybe all you can hope for. But what about L1 now? Is it going to retrieve that two-point source? Okay, and, uh, and these are the same pictures, this one with color and this one without because it's difficult to, 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 uh, to visualize very well. So, I mean, you can, if you don't see anything here, look at this. If you don't see anything here, look at this and so on. And, uh, you know, or else I'll tell you what you should see. That's the third option. And so, uh, using L2, I get garbage both in color and without. And uh, using L1, uh, not L1G, L1, I do get some uh, sparse solution, you see? Sparse solution. And using a weighted L1, which basically make it, makes the, the column of the, of the matrix J uh, of unit one norm, then I get a, a clearer result. Sparse, but it's wrong, it's wrong because that basically says that the sources, the muscles, are all, all near the surface. It really is wrong, you see. So it's not clear that I want to rush to, <laughs> to improve codes if the actual result uh, is wrong. 
So there's something in sparseness. There's another side of sparseness or sparsity. You know, uh, it could. It is more definitive in some way than some blurs. Okay, and if it's wrong, it really points to a wrong thing. I don't know if, you, if, you, if I'm making myself clear. Suppose that uh, you ask me, where is, uh, where is Vancouver Island? Okay, and I say, oh, it's east. It's east. That's one thing. The other thing I say, well, I actually am disoriented. I don't know where it is. That is less, this is just, that's mis misleading, really. Right? If I, I'm not so sure about myself. And this is just kind of being sure about yourself. Uh, you can do some analysis. Where am I with time? So uh, you can do some analysis with the, on this. So let's uh, do a very simple analysis. So we look at the two norm once again, data fitting with two norm plus beta times W U one norm. Okay, and uh, let's say that the, this matrix J, like so, this matrix with uh, more columns than rows. Uh, has this uh, singular value decomposition u sigma v transposed, where the matrix sigma is uh, diagonal and uh, u and v are orthogonal. Then, and let's assume as in the simplest case, which is that the w here is actually v transposed. If that's the case, then I can define z to be w u, that would be z here, uh, and uh, everything is diagonalized. In other words, the matrix J has been replaced by a diagonal matrix. So now, if this guy was not around, take beta equals zero for a moment, then, I, then the minimization will give me uh, sigma i, zi equals ci for each i. And so zi is ci over sigma i. However, I have noise. And so the noise will be divided by sigma i. So for the smaller uh, singular values, I'm going to get garbage uh, increased. Yeah, and so the typical thing to do here is to use truncated SVD, which says that if, if the sigma i's are too small, then set the zi to be zero. Otherwise, uh, set the zi to be ci over sigma i. This is truncated SVD, and this is the, uh, uh, the workhorse, the workhorse for, uh, for um, model reduction. So now, what we can do is let's consider a sparse representation just to see if we can reconstruct it or under what conditions. So let's say that we have basic variables, let's call it basic variables, uh, i, where zi star is not zero. The, the, the equal one here is not important, not zero. And the zi star is equal to zero for all the non-basic guys. Okay? Now the question is, under what con conditions can we reconstruct uh, for this uh, uh, ground truth, we construct, reconstruct a solution that has the same z uh, zero sparsity pattern. That's the question. And not a different one, like we saw in our example. So uh, if we, if we, do, if we uh, write sigma plus as the maximum of the singular values which, among the basic variables, and sigma one the minimum among the non-basic ones, and then here is a theorem. And, and let's assume that the noise has a zero mean and rogue square covariance. Uh, then there's a theorem that says, well, uh, it will work if sigma plus is less than or equal than sigma minus, or this condition holds. This condition gets worse and worse if this, this guy here gets smaller and smaller if the problem gets more and more imposed. So it's more and more strict if the problem is more and more imposed. Essentially, if the problem is so highly imposed, you need this to happen. And what this means is that somehow the singular values of the problem have to align with my invention of a true solution. You see, go ahead. That's a little bit because of the construction of, of the example, because one of the main theorems in compared or observations in complex sensing is the measurement basis and the, the sparsity basis should be incoherent. In your example, they are the same. I am not talking about compressive sensing at all. For sparse theory, for L1 to work, this is one of the fundamental uh, requirements that wherever you're measuring. So here's an, an I'm still example. not talking about compressive sensing at all. I mean, to, to, to compressive L1, sensing. For L1 to recover the correct sparse solution, yeah. you have to measure in a basis that is incoherent with, with your sparsity basis. 
If that's not the case, you cannot expect. Nobody claims that you should get the right spot. Yeah, that's right. I'm actually claiming exactly this, that I cannot expect this. Yeah, yeah but that's, 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 that's all I'm claiming. Very aligned with the sparse approximation compressing sensing theory. But I'm not doing compressing sensing. I'm saying, that I'm trying to, to explain why we got so bad such bad results. And this uh, uh, um, theorem uh, seems to be to support it. Basically, I cannot expect, as you said, I cannot expect, uh, in this case, L1 sparse reconstruction to give me the correct sparse reconstruction. That is my point. Compressive sensing means that you have to have data to compress. I mean, you cannot use the word compress without compressing data. And for having data to compress means you have to have a lot of data. Here, I don't have a lot of data. And there's no way I will give, give up any data that I have. You see, it's, it's a very different, different uh, uh, setting than the typical uh, image uh, compression that we saw at the beginning. It's not the same setting. But can you consider that your boundary, your boundary uh, values are compressed measurements of your full data? Um, no. You're collecting fewer no, samples. No, no, you cannot say that. The, the point of, 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 uh, of uh, the usual JPEG reconstruction uh, or, or compression is that you have uh, too much data, abundant data, too much data, whatever, right? I mean, the picture that I showed you at the beginning was taken by a D700 camera. It has 12 million pixels. Okay, and, and, and what does it mean? It means that if you write it in, in a Fourier base or a Boivec base, you have 12 million basis functions. Do you really need all these basis functions for, uh, you know, for any picture, even if it's on your iPhone? And so on. So, so uh, then you have a lot of room for compressing. But you've got to have something to compress to begin with. To have data only on the boundary is not, it's a, it's a partial uh, uh, set of all the values of the solution, but it's not, it's not like, it's not the same thing. It's not the same context. Let, let, let me go on, uh, and I'll be happy to discuss this again uh, later. Nonlinear problems get, things get worse with nonlinear problems, because now you cannot even expect anything from, from L1. Because uh, if your objective function is not a straight line, then as it touches the constraints, it's not going to necessarily touch here or here, and therefore you don't necessarily expect uh, sparsity anymore. Okay. What remains is L1G. L1G is still uh, of interest because once again, L2G smears discontinuities, L1G doesn't, or less. So, uh, we are going to look at L1G versus L2G, and forget about L1. Uh, this is uh, the last example of the day, and as a last example, it's really the largest of them all. So, so here we have an inverse problem, and the inverse problem is this. Now we don't know the conductivity sigma in the same sort of divergent sigma grad of uh, potential V. We have a bunch of sources QI, and for each source QI, we calculate a uh, potential VI if we knew sigma. We have measurements for, for, uh, if for each, uh, for each uh, uh, I, I going from one to S, we have measurements of the potential on the boundary, okay? And uh, from that, we wish to reconstruct this conductivity sigma. That's the setup of the, of the experiment. Uh, now let's say that uh, our domain here, we have a square and we have points on uh, the two walls of the square and we basically vary them and uh, we look at each pair and from each pair we construct a QI by a delta function, it's a, a source, source function, a, a point function source and uh, obtain in this way a bunch of experiments. And so uh, if you give me sigma, I will have a U that relates to that sigma that uh, will allow me to construct, uh, the, to predict the data. And then now I have uh, uh, data that is observed and I compare the predicted to the observed data and from this I want to reconstruct sigma. So the question is, do I have a chance uh, solving this problem? The answer is no. <laughs> Unless something more happens, it's a very difficult problem. And, but fortunately, uh, often we know that our uh, conductivity sigma of x is, uh, has a lower and upper bound. 
So uh, we are going to define a U based on a function that, that incorporates this bound. The details are not important. The point is, I have uh, a problem for u. Once I have u, sigma will be a psi of, of u, where psi is given by this, and incorporate the bounds. Okay. If I don't have that, then L1g is of no interest at all, because you just are going to get some blurb, blurred thing, and uh, why do you need L1g to sharpen it? You have no, not enough data to, to have anything sharp. So we use uh, experiments for this. Oh, it's important to understand that uh, if I increase the number of experiments, I have a better chance to reconstruct a good solution. Again, I don't even need to even think about L1G unless total variation unless I have a sufficiently good solution. So I need to a sufficiently large number of experiments to see it. <coughs> okay, sufficiently large number. So if S is equal to 1,000, for example, that means that just in order to 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 do a misfit. J U minus whatever, uh, I need to solve a thousand PDEs. So I have to be careful. It can, it can take a few days to solve a problem like that without difficulty, unless uh, you, do, you are careful. And uh, here we do a stochastic methods for model reduction in case that S is large. Other people have done that uh, too. Well done. And uh, Felix is sitting over there, uh, have done work of the same sort. And so is a microfrequent in a different context. Uh, and again, we do a generalized Tikhonov, and here are some results. So for S equal 4, comparing L2G to L1G, uh, L1G is not better, not better, and therefore not worth it. If you increase the number of experiments to 64, uh, so I should say that this is the true solution, and it does have discontinuities, okay? If, uh, there are edges here, otherwise, of course, there's no reason to use L1G. Uh, but even with edges in the exact solution, there is not enough information here to obtain it. Here there is already, uh, and this one is a bit better than this one. And then when we go to a thousand, uh, a thousand uh, experiments with 1% noise, then we see, in fact, that L1G wins. So only if we have a lot of experiments and only if we have little noise, then L1G is worthwhile. We don't want to forget it. I actually believe that here it is more, worth, more worthwhile than just to do denoising, in my view. For denoising, you have non-convex non guys. But for this, to, to introduce non-convexity to a monster like that, it's a bad news. <laughs> so you don't want to do that. Okay. So, so L1G is great here in the, in, uh, with sufficient, sufficiently sufficient information. So there are indeed better results for larger S, first of all. And then for S really large, L1G becomes significantly better than L2G. Uh, this is expensive. These are expensive computations, and we have a bunch of ways to make the cost more reasonable. Uh, and so L1G, total variation, is worth considering, but it doesn't always deliver. And you have to understand <coughs> that in this context, once again, you have to have enough good data for this to be worthwhile. Uh, L1 uh, for this problem is not really uh, is not really a contender. Let me just uh, uh, write this, yeah, display all of these conclusions together. Uh, in many situations, once again, L1-based regularization is well worth uh, using. It is not by chance that suddenly uh, everybody is doing L1. There are some wonderful things to to get. I mean, you can actually distinguish edges in a way that uh, was not done before. You can actually uh, 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 do compressive sensing uh, and so on and, and uh, get sparse solutions in a way that L2-based regularizations don't give you. But at the same time, it's important to understand that these techniques are not suitable for all problems. You have to, make, to, to be careful and to see under what situation, what is your problem, what are the pro the what's the situation with it? Does, do you have good enough uh, data to, to worry about L1? Uh, do you have uh, reason to assume that you can actually uh, 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 compress things or sparsify things in a meaningful way? And in practice, my suggestion is still to say the default is L2 based, not L1 based. Okay, and you need a reason for L1 based. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Uri. So we have a few people in the audience.
concerned with the owner of L1, so there might be a lively discussion here. Let's open it for questions, David. Um, so uh, you didn't mention methods that combine L1 and L2. So in computer vision, we do a lot of things where we, let's say, minimize the Huber norm, where outliers are treated with the L1, but points near the solution are with L2 and that. Yeah. First of all, handles outliers, and it's a very nice, smooth, convex function that's easy to optimize. Yeah, actually, I did mention it. Uh, so this work that uh, Wang and I did uh, on the blur, and I showed you the blurring example. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. That uh, had a, uh, a Huber uh, thing, and there's actually, actually a non-trivial question there: when when to switch uh, between L1 and L2? And there are two uh, methods of thinking about that. Uh, one of them uh, is mine, and the other one is Eldad's. And <laughs> we've been having lots of discussion on this. Uh, and uh, in particular, what do you do? So, I, so I basically argue I will do it by the resolution. Basically, I, I, I'm saying uh, I will move to L2 only when the resolution is such that I don't no longer know what's zero and what's non-zero. Whereas uh, other people say, yes, that was just kidding. Uh, other people say, uh, I have an idea of what the jump is depending on my physical application, and I'm going to use that in order to decide. Okay. Both of these uh, approaches make sense if you sit on it. Um, I should say that I know that uh, auto stitch has a, a Huber norm in, uh, in uh, yeah, the data field. Large scale structure for motion problems. Yeah. Uh, they want to solve million unknowns in a large system. Uh, they'll, they'll find that very effective. Yeah. Yeah. I believe that in, in your case, it has to do with the outliers. Right. It's essentially just a way of uh, uh, de-weighting out, uh, yeah. starting outliers. Yeah. That's a great so use of L1, actually, if I, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, not only because I used it for my own <laughs> PhD thesis in a different context. <laughs> Go ahead. Would you be happy if instead we make a statement that L1 and L2 are defaults, because they're both really easy, you know, for most practitioners in this area. And oh, I'll be happy with anything. And it's <laughs> the ones that we haven't discussed, the one like yours that works so well <laughs> that you didn't talk about. Um, isn't it the case that for particular problems, if we want to really do well, there are these problems for which there's theory, like Oscar was mentioning, where we know that we can say L1 or L2 will do well. But there's a whole huge realm of practical applications out there where we need to actually invent very good regular low prices. Sure. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. I'm not trying to say you must do this or that. I mean, actually, I'm saying more or less the opposite. <laughs> um, I, I, I guess what I'm saying is, uh, I have seen students uh, sort of f feeling that they must do it using L1. That uh, easily lead to big, diff big co programming jobs, you know. Now, and if you don't have to do it, uh, you know, I mean, you are, when you do L1 instead of L2, even though you don't have to, that means that you move to nonlinear problems, you move to less smooth problems, you introduce a lot of difficulties by doing that, and it has to be worthwhile. Okay, that's that's been my point. Um, uh, I mean, there are situations, again, I've shown examples, in fact, where neither of those is what, what I would do. I actually, uh, it took me a long time to decide that, uh, for instance, an anisotropic diffusion doesn't do as much as uh, lots of my friends said it does, <laughs> for instance. And isotropic diffusion is worse, but even anisotropic diffusion, if you want to, to do things more, uh, you know, to distinguish features better, you, you really don't want to use that in image processing, I, I think. Maybe I'll just make a, a comment sort of relating to what Nando said. Um, so I guess maybe in statistics or machine learning, what you'd like to do is actually have the data tell you, not choose L2 or L1, but try and find this from the data itself. And so some of the ways of going about doing this is we've been thinking about these um, you know, penalties as probability distribution. So I think everyone knows L2 gives you a Gaussian and L1 gives you a Laplace. And what are the other kinds of, you know, ways of parameterizing probability distributions that give you those properties? And so some of the interesting things are sort of doing what they call scale mixtures of Gaussian distributions that let you parameterize these kind of uh, penalties. And if you want to actually write the optimization function, 
then the whole you know, theory of doing levy processes to see what the corresponding optimization is. So I think that's, the, that's one thought. The other thought is that you do want to try and be closer to the L0 case, right? And so if you were doing a statistical problem there, what you want to do is do two steps. Um, you want to maybe do a hypothesis test first to say, should this thing be zero or not? And if you decide if it's zero, then do something else. Then do L1 or then do L2. Yeah. And so that they might call the spike and slab kind of you know, penalty or regularization. So I think you know, there's all, it's, that's why computational science I think is really nice because all these things are very much related. So. Oh, I think it's, uh, yeah, I have absolutely no problem with this. But those are Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, don't want to get too close to P equals minus. zero. But, uh, but yeah, sure. I, I, that then, I forget who did work like that uh, a while ago. Hui. Hmm? With Hui. With Hui. With Hui Huang. <laughs> uh, I thought also with Luis before, no? With Lior. But you guys, are, you, you've been talking about something, I think, more complicated than if very call correctly. That. But sure, sure, I mean, uh, yeah. I hope I didn't say anything <laughs> against what you just said. <laughs>
in a time where the legal department gets involved in the all the different discussions basically end there somehow. Some kind of black hole. Yeah, yeah.
Before I came here, I guess yeah, I would get the answer in one hour, so when I go back, I have Yeah, I guess. This I'm not sure the one hour, but what are you going to do? You need three parameters. The thing is along the frequency. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm running this one. They thought this was, they were suspicious when it was mentioned. Nothing that takes cool stuff. Yeah, a long I mean, I guess no one is uh, interesting. I mean, it takes days. The, the only solution that is the yeah. gradient descent. So it's obviously not true. You might uh, get a little just too much. That's, that's why I'm going to show you the money. Give me the money for the one yeah. back, right? And this is actually yeah. 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 And good luck with these offers. Uh, well, you get to see. In fact, we're going to pay for the offer. Oh, yeah. So when will that be? So, well, it depends whether we can have an offer. 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 Yeah, super normal. Right. Whether you can do it with this film team. Thank you for that. We're actually, we've actually got a credit. We just have a credit with them right now, but that's okay because we will see the way you can do it with yourself who are moving. Just love that you take your data. Is this worthwhile? I guess. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Another cookie at least a clear there. vision that took people a while to realize that. L2, and then they would have all these different methods for this just to find out where an outlier is. Audience. And then I realized, oh no, actually. Where's the asking on the polling deadline next month? It's like, much smoother. Yeah. The is much better. I see now has its rolling deadline. Ah, so. So you must be able to strategize about long haul. I thought there was something that would be run by zero. Submit to a good place. You can get the objective to submit to somewhere else. Strategy. Yeah, but I thought you just had to put those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah
Yeah, well, uh, machine learning is interested in all the areas in between, like all the other norms and other popular distributions. We did a paper and we used LTLM for estimation of the parameters of nonlinear models. In our, in our uh, data sets and our application, and one was the uh, measure of models. Oh, yeah. But that might be because. <laughs> In mine too. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I mean, for a lot of problems, L1 it definitely is a sort of real revolution in how, what you can drive and so on. But I guess your point is there's also lots of problems for which L2 is still the right solution, <laughs> which is really true. In my PhD thesis, I actually did some over the term using L1. Uh, but the, the sort of idea of selecting points in 